From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power with Anne-Marie Hordern in San Francisco today. I'm Joe Matthew. Congressman George Santos facing another expulsion effort in the House of Representatives. We're going to speak with former assistant U.S. attorney Nick Ackerman this hour. Who ended up with Who a stronger with hand coming out of the APAC summit this week in San Francisco? We'll discuss with Suzanne Skagans, Clark University Associate Professor of China Studies. And fallout grows from Elon Musk's comments on an anti-Semitic social media post on X. Now, Apple reportedly pulling advertising from the platform. And Joe, I'll tell you, here in San Francisco, that story has caught quite the stir, not just from a rebuke from the White House, but also the yeah. fact that he actually had to, um, he was replaced on a panel. Now, officially, APAC is saying that that was due to a scheduling error, but uh, reading the tea leaves, I think that had a little bit more to do with uh, that post. But as I am wrapping up the APAC summit, Joe, I just want to bring to you, all the leaders will be leaving and uh, she now is recommitting to a peaceful path as he leaves the United States and heads back to China. Okay, so that makes it sound like a pretty successful visit. You know, when we saw the readout separately, one, of course, in the form of a news conference from Joe Biden, the readout from President Xi, everybody was talking a bit tough. We had uh, the dictator remark over here. We had some pretty tough talk about Taiwan, for instance, about not arming Taiwan uh, coming out of Beijing. But everybody still left smiling. And Marie, you were there. Yeah. They did leave smiling. I think really how you have to frame this relationship and this meeting was that it's not so much a warming of ties, potentially maybe she to the chief executive officers that paid a decent amount of cash to sit with him. But the relationship was at such a dark place, a 40-year low, Joe, that it was about putting a floor under it to make sure it just didn't get any worse. Well, we're lucky to have Anne-Marie in San Francisco tonight for the view from the West Coast as we read through uh, the remnants here of this important visit from the president. And with me in Washington now is Bloomberg's Megan Scully and Jack Fitzpatrick of Bloomberg government with a breaking news story uh, coming from Capitol Hill. It's great to see you both. Happy Friday and thank you for joining. We weren't sure what we were going to be covering tonight, but it's not a shutdown. So cheers to that. Speaker Mike Johnson is making news, however, in what you could call a little bit of a Friday news dump. And I'm looking at a statement here. He tweeted a short time ago a link to view the January 6 tapes for yourself, as he says, to restore America's trust and faith in their government, we must have transparency. Uh, this is an enormous number of hours of video that apparently will go public now, remembering that Kevin McCarthy had cut a deal with Tucker Carlson at one point to show uh, a, a lot of the, the, the footage that had not been seen. Who is this for? What's he doing on a Friday night with all this footage? This is definitely an olive branch to the hardliners in the party, folks like Matt Gates, who have been pushing for these tapes to be released widely. Tucker Carlson was the was the sole receiver of of the tapes when when McCarthy did release them in February. They've been allowed in a reading room in the yep. Capitol these last several months, but this is the first time they're they're going to be released online for the American public at large to view. It's 40,000 hours of tapes, so wow. I think that's something like five years or, or something of, of actual footage mm -hmm. of that day. Uh, so I don't know that anybody will actually watch it from beginning to end, mm -hmm. but, but it'll be there for, for folks to consume. Mm -hmm. You know, Joe, what I'm really curious about when it comes to this footage is, is this at any potential a national security concern, given the fact that the U.S. Yep. is going to have all of this footage from a number of cameras around the U.S. Capitol? But I've been out in the West Coast, but there's been a lot more drama happening in Washington, D.C. And, Jack, I need to ask you about Congressman George Santos. This is Long Island, Queens District. Does the third district in New York now get a special election? Is that what we are heading towards here? It's still really hard to predict. The news today was that Michael Guest, uh, aside from his position uh, on the ethics committee, called for an expulsion vote, again, a third expulsion vote, 
and the committee put out a report from a, a, an investigative subcommittee with a lot of detail uh, substantiating complaints about uh, Congressman Santos. It's hard to even get into all of it, but it, you know, the blatant uh, misuse of campaign funds was a, a phrase they used. Uh, it's a bit more official than previous attempts to oust him because it's accompanied by this report from uh, the Ethics Committee. It's not just coming from one of his fellow New Yorkers. A, a more, some of the moderates from New York wanted him out because they saw him as an embarrassment. It's a bit more of a formal and official uh, and maybe widespread concern being expressed by George Santos. But remember, you need two-thirds to actually kick him out, and they didn't even get a majority in the last vote. So it's, it's not an easy vote to hold still. Well, that's that's a great point, uh, Megan. The, the excuse, though, is due process, right? They were waiting for the Ethics Committee, in many cases here, uh, to weigh in, as we heard from lawmakers who decided to vote against expulsion. We asked Sarah Chamberlain about this yesterday on Balance of Power, who runs the Republican Main Street Partnership, and she made pretty clear her members want George Santos out. Here she is. If he does go, we can have a chance of holding the seat. If he doesn't go, we think the Democrats will pick it up. So, yes, I mean, they would really, we did the petition before to try to get him um, to leave. The chairman of ethics committee is the chairman of Main Street. So we're in hopes that this time he will depart. Interesting. George Santos has called a news conference mm -hmm. for November 30th. Will he be expelled before he has a chance to resign? Well, Congress doesn't come back until November 28th, so they're gone for the Thanksgiving mm -hmm. holiday. Uh, whether or not that they would give you the two days needed to would, have this vote, right? it would give you the two days. Um, it's unclear, though, whether they will um, hold this vote within two days. Whether there will be a motion to table mm -hmm. um, it, it, if, for instance, he's announcing he's resigning on the 30th. We don't know what he is announcing. I think if you are Speaker Johnson, that might be the route that you're hoping he takes, because then you're not putting members up for a difficult vote. Mm -hmm. However, um, as you and you mentioned as well, the due process, uh, the the report, the ethics report was eye popping. Forty five hundred dollars for Hermes and <laughs> honeymoon in Vegas yeah. and, and, and Botox. Botox treatments. Love it. And what members are saying is this is just so egregious that we don't even need to wait for a conviction. OK, so we need to wait to see what happens with Mr. Santos, and that potentially can change the numbers uh, in the House of Representatives and an even slimmer majority for the Republicans. Um, but, Jack, speaking of all the lawmakers going home for Thanksgiving, when they come back, they have a very long to-do list. And I know part of what the president is focused on, um, especially given he was focused on foreign policy here in, uh, at the APEC summit, is making sure that they are sending aid to the national security partners around the world, whether that be Taiwan, Israel, Ukraine. What's the likelihood of this happening even before the end of the year? It's not a great sign, especially for Ukraine, that they didn't attach something to this stopgap measure. Uh, when you have a funding deadline that threatens a shutdown, that's a legislative vehicle. And there were members, especially in the Senate, who wanted to strike a deal on Ukraine funding and try to get something on the U.S.-Mexico border to get conservative support for it and get it done by the November 17th deadline. I, I, I've asked supporters, people like Chris Coons in the Senate, um, Shelley Moore Capito, you know, can you pass something like that on its own, or did it need to be attached to something else that's bigger? They're still banking on the fact that if they can strike a deal tying together Ukraine and border measures, and then it would be a bit more easy to add on Israel and Taiwan, it is strong enough to go on its own. But it's still contingent on a bipartisan border deal. It's very, very difficult. Uh, and the fact that they couldn't do it this month uh, is not a great sign. All right. Great start to the program with a smart conversation. Megan Scully and Jack Fitzpatrick, thank you for the insights here in Washington. Coming up, is the U.S. economy on track for a soft landing? We'll get the outlook from Mark Zandi, the chief economist at Moody's Analytics. It's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg.
We're at this inflection point. Are we slowing to a soft landing or are we slowing into a hard landing? A slowdown or a soft landing or a recession. It's a soft landing or a greater downturn. So far, it looks like we're getting this immaculate disinflation. Good economic growth, inflation is coming down. There's a, uh, you know, a good chance that we can have a soft landing. That's really the, the core of our, our base case thesis. There is a kind of realization now that perhaps that soft landing narrative is starting to gain a lot more traction. A soft landing is incredibly difficult to pull off. The data is not definitive. But I do think what you're seeing right now is going to give a lot of people hope that we're back in a kind of Goldilocks scenario. This is a soft landing year. Goodness, overwhelming optimism here that the U.S. economy could, in fact, be on track to emerge from the Fed's rate hiking cycle without tumbling into a recession. That's, of course, what Mark Zandi told us was going to happen, and he's with us now, the chief economist at Moody's Analytics. It's good to see you, uh, Mark. Welcome to Friday, and welcome back to Bloomberg. You tweeted just a couple of days ago that a year back, a strongly held consensus, which did not include me, you write, expected a recession dead ahead. You go on to write, the consensus has been wrong. This time is different. Are we here? Are we in it now? Is this the soft landing? Yeah, that was my I told you so uh, tweet, uh, Joe. I, I, you know, I just couldn't resist. Probably premature. You know, we, I think we need to wait until the Fed actually starts lowering interest rates to declare victory that we've soft landed. But it all feels pretty good to me. Uh, Inflation is coming in uh, very gracefully as the supply shocks from the pandemic and the Russian war uh, go to the rearview mirror. And that's all happening without any significant hit to jobs and unemployment. So soft landing feels like a pretty likely scenario. Not quite there yet. Mm. Things can happen. Uh, but I feel pretty confident uh, that that's what uh, the future holds. We are seeing some companies, though, Mark, lay individuals off. And some economists are pointing to unemployment figures that actually show we can be next year on the cusp of a recession. I know the unemployment rate's at 3.9%. But it looks like it's bound to potentially go past that 4%, which I know the White House loves to tout, remaining under 4% for 21 months going. Are there any concerns you have with the labor market right now? Well, Anne Murray, it is slowing. Uh, it, you know, uh, lots of different measures indicate that it's easing up. But that's, that's by design, right? That's exactly what the Federal Reserve is trying to do, slow down the job market, cool things off, get wage growth back in so that inflation gets back in the bottle. So this is exactly what you'd expect to happen. It's going to script. Now, you know, it, I think it is natural that when you're in, you know, seeing this slowdown, you begin to get nervous and worried, well, you know, is it just going to slow and soft land or is it going to slow and crash, which is a reasonable thing to be worried about. But, you know, all the fundamentals suggest that you know, everything is kind of sticking the script here. It's coming in for the landing and it's going to stick it. Uh, mm -hmm. So I feel pretty good about it. There are, you know, there are some labor market indicators that uh, are flashing a little bit of yellow here. You know, the continuing claims, you know, they're up uh, a bit. But I, I, you know, I just caution putting too much weight on any one indicator. There's so many issues with regard to measurement, particularly with those continuing claims and seasonal adjustment. I mean, if you look at the plethora of the data, it just feels like, you know, mm -hmm. everything is slowing exactly as uh, it should. It's, it's uh, to script. It's uh, by design. You know, the script, of course, could change, Mark. We have no shortage of potential wild cards. In fact, we keep adding to them. A year ago, we were talking about in inflation being uh, prompted by the war in Ukraine, one that could take a turn at any moment. We've added great turmoil in the Middle East. And while we've seen Oil prices coming down recently. I wonder which one of these you've got your eyes on. Yeah, no, there's always risk, lots of risk. Uh, and, you know, the Israel Hamas war is, you know, is, uh, you know, obviously very disconcerting. And if it uh, does spread to the rest of the region and disrupt uh, oil, particularly coming from Iran, that would be the most likely uh, place where we'd see the disruption. Yeah, you know, that mm -hmm. would change the picture pretty quickly. You know, nothing is more pernicious than a run up in oil prices. And uh, fortunately, they've been moving south, not north. But uh, you can't con con certainly construct that uh, scenario. But, you know, Joe, let me again, just because it's Friday afternoon and Thanksgiving's dead ahead. And I do think we should You're gonna be going to pull me in off the that. ledge. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Look, you know, if I had this interview with you, probably did four or five, six weeks ago, I'd say, hey, Joe, 
we got a number of problems that we, we're going to have to uh, grapple with. We've got a UAW strike. We've got a potential government mm -hmm. shutdown. We've got high oil prices. We've got interest rates going skyward. We've got student loan borrowers that have got to start repaying. Well, OK, the UAW strike is over. There's no government shutdown. Oil prices are much lower than they were. Interest rates are back in. And I can't discern any major, fall, any significant fallout from the increase in student loan payments. So, yeah, there's Amazing. things to worry about. Always are. But it feels pretty good right now. Well, it feels pretty good, but Moody's last week downgraded its outlook. And I want you to take a listen to what Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen weighing in on that downgrade and her response, uh, given the state of the U.S. economy. Let me start with the Moody's decision. They maintained the U.S. AAA rating, but um, indicated that there's a negative outlook. This is a decision that I disagree with. The American economy is fundamentally strong, and Treasury securities remain the world's preeminent safe and liquid asset. Okay, Mark, so I know you can't directly comment on what Moody said last week, which is downgrading the outlook for the U.S., but do you think that that downgrade put a bit more of a pressure on lawmakers to get through a continuing resolution and potentially for the rest of the year try to get the fiscal house in order? Well, they don't need a ratings action to get the you know uh, to need to light a fire here. It's pretty obvious that you know something's got to give, something's got to change. I know I am very optimistic about the near term, but the longer term, we've got some issues, and our fiscal situation is clearly one of them. We've got to change it. I mean, if we don't change current law, tax policy, spending, uh, the trajectory here is very ominous. I mean, the Congressional Bu Budget Office, the nonpartisan group of folks that do this work. They, they, they forecast under reasonable assumptions about the economy, by the way, that uh, the debt to GDP ratio, which is the best measure of our indebtedness, is going to go from just south of 100 percent to 115 percent 10 years from now to 180 percent 30 years from now. That's when their forecast ends. But you can you know, you can do the trend lines. That's not sustainable. So lawmakers do need to get it together. And I don't think they need a rating agency to tell them that. That's pretty obvious. And the bond market is going to react. I mean, it, one reason why yields have risen, I mean, if you go back six months ago, the 10-year was firmly below 4%. Now it's firmly above 4%. And I think a good part of that is goes back to concerns of, um, among investors around, uh, you know, what, what's going to happen with our long-run fiscal situation. Lawmakers have to come back and figure this out. Mark, thank you so much for your time and happy Friday. Mark Zandi, Chief Economist at Moody's Analytics. Coming up, China scholar Suzanne Skagans on the improved U.S.-China ties and the impact of this year's APEC summit, the first time the U.S. has hosted it in 12 years right here in San Francisco. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg. A huge week for U.S.-China diplomacy with the APEC summit right here in San Francisco. Let's discuss with Suzanne Scoggins, Associate Professor of Political Science and China Studies at Clark University and the author of Policing China, Street-Level Cops in the Shadow of Protest. Suzanne, thank you so much for joining us. I know you spent some time in China as well this summer, so you have a real sense of where relation, this relationship was going. What was your biggest takeaway outside, out of this uh, Biden-Xi bilateral summit? So thank you so much for having me, Emory. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I would say that this is just uh, beyond sort of expectations, um, and to go maybe a little bit uh, further is, is is beyond really our wildest dreams. Like we have um, we have seen the continued deterioration of U.S.-China relations. I feel like every time I go to Washington, uh, all the conversations there just veer toward negative and more negative, and then uh, to go into China and to see how much people want to engage, but also how concerned they are about the, the direction um, to really have these two leaders come together uh, in a friendly way and, and to you know, come to, to some agreements that uh, may or may not come to fruition, but to at least like give lip service to that and to 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 be walking and and, and, and looking at cars together. This is a this is a huge step. I know that the Chinese foreign minister called this uh, a milestone event, and I think that uh, everyone feels that way. This is this is not what we expected, and um, it is uh, a really great 
um, event and, uh, and, and progression for U.S.-China relations that I think uh, I'm excited about and I know my colleagues are as well. Suzanne, there was a big game of expectations, as always, uh, going into this meeting and that a lot of people saw as being long overdue. Uh, some folks thought small gains were achieved. There were maybe expectations for a deal to unlock sales of, of Boeing 737 Maxes, for instance. There was talk of pandas. But we got a couple of important things here, including <laughs> the deal uh, on counter-narcotics and, of course, military-to-military -military communication. And I wonder which is more important to you. So um, because I'm a security person, I, I think that both of these uh, border on things that are very important to me. And I, I think that on the in terms of the crisis, right, the, the potential for a crisis in the South China Sea, the military to military uh, reinstatement of communications, that's just huge. And in terms of deliverables, what this is going to look like is that, you know, telephone conversations between um, commanders are going to be, the theater commanders are going to be uh, reinstated. And, you know, it's not just at the highest levels, it's also at, at, at lower levels. And we've got subs underground, under, under the, the sea, we've got um, ships on the sea, we've got planes in the air, we have so many opportunities for uh, just accidents to happen. And when you don't have those lines of communication open the way that it has been, uh, it's going to be uh, a, a really big shift that is uh, very important in terms of ensuring safety and just ensuring that there's not miscommunication, that, 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 that they're able to, to talk to one another. And to have, to, to, for so long, you know, since, since August of, of last year, that the just these lines of communication have not been open, and so that is essential. Uh, on the other side, we're seeing uh, the U.S. and China coming together on uh, counter narcotics, and this is something that is uh, a big concern. I work on policing in China; it's a big concern for police in China. Um, they've been trying to China. Uh, the Chinese side has been trying to um, get as many agreements as possible, and on the U.S. side, you know, we're, we're facing a fentanyl crisis, and to actually go in and uh, stop some of this production of uh, the, the phenol uh, precursors uh, will hopefully have a, a major impact on human lives here in the United States. So I, I really hope that uh, the, the deliverables for this one will be, um, will, will be achieved because this is, this is had the potential, the real potential to, to impact lives and to also achieve state goals on both sides. So I think this is a, these, these are both two really, really great in, uh, developments. Suzanne, we're glad you could join us. Suzanne Scoggins with us from beautiful Worcester, Mass. tonight. We thank you. Coming up, a setback for Donald Trump and his D.C. election obstruction trial. And Congressman George Santos may be facing the fire soon. We're going to talk about that with former Watergate assistant prosecutor Nick Ackerman on both of these stories. With Anne-Marie Hordern in San Francisco, I'm Joe Matthew in Washington. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. thought that uh, Santos should have been ridden from the House of Representatives months ago. I was uh, one of the ones that led the charge a couple weeks ago, along with my New York freshman, uh, in order to uh, put the expulsion resolution on the floor. Obviously, it wasn't successful. But I do believe that um, it, it helped uh, the Ethics Committee move their investigation along, I would hope. Uh, and that now the, the rest of the conference and the rest of the House of Representatives uh, are getting a uh, bird's eye view of exactly mm -hmm. what New York thought all along. It's Long Island Congressman Anthony Desposito earlier today as the House Ethics Committee chair earlier also files a resolution to expel George Santos from Congress. Let's bring in Nick Ackerman, former assistant U.S. attorney, former assistant special prosecutor for Watergate, who I can't think was ever uh, considering uh, a segment like this at that point. Mr. Ackerman, welcome back here. I'm not sure your thoughts on this. Thank if you, you saw the report from the Ethics Committee, it's blowing a lot of minds here in Washington, D.C., uh, just the, the, the outrageous nature of the whole thing. Uh, the, I guess the biggest question I have is, is he expelled or does he resign first? I'm not sure. Um, I, I think he may just go for the expulsion. I don't really see that from his standpoint he has much to lose. 
I think this is the end of the road for him. That 58 six page report, which I have read cover to cover, is an absolute blockbuster. It goes into minute detail about everything that he did. Uh, the fact that he's tried to blame this on his former treasurer, that he claims that he's a victim. Uh, a lot of this sounds very familiar in the sense that he's basically a drop, uh, adopted uh, the Trumpian way of attacking these allegations. And I think if he continues that way, he's probably going to hang in there and he'll be expelled. Well, you're talking about this blockbuster report. I want to bring our audience, for those who haven't read uh, the report, some of what it says. It says Santos, quote, sought to fraudulently exploit every aspect of his House candidacies for his own personal financial profit, blatantly stole from his campaign, deceived donors, reported fictitious loans, diverted more campaign money to himself, and he sustained all of this through a constant series of lies to his constituents, donors, and staff about his background and experience. Sir, what happens when he's out of office? Does that make this much harder for him in terms of his legal path forward? Well, his legal path forward is not looking good. Uh, he's now under indictment in uh, the Eastern District of New York for fraud, um, not only for uh, relating to his political donations, but also to fraud in obtaining um, unemployment insurance. Uh, this report also refers a number of these false statements that he made both to the Federal Election Commission uh, and to the House um, uh, committee uh, that takes in all of the statements, financial statements uh, from congressmen. Uh, he's in a deep boatload of trouble. Um, and I don't think anything could get any worse for him than this. Uh, I don't see him ever being able to get employed uh, after this. I don't see him being able to do anything. I mean, he really has basically uh, burned himself to the core here, uh, lying about his background, who he is, what he did, uh, and stole lots of money from political donors. Uh, he set up yeah. scams where he claimed to, you know, have donated or himself or loaned for $80,000 to his campaign, uh, which he's being paid back for that he never loaned in the first place. Um, so mm -hmm. there are a whole series of scams like that that he's in deep trouble for. He's using campaign money apparently to pay for his OnlyFans account, Mr. Ackerman. This uh, just gets better the further you read down this. It wouldn't keep him from making a lot of money writing a book, would it? Um, probably not. I mean, maybe that's the best thing he can do, and he could even play himself, I suppose, in the movie afterwards. Um, but go. I suppose he could do Botox commercials. I mean, one of the things he spent the <laughs> campaign money on was Botox. So I don't know if Botox really thought hard about it. They might think maybe they could have him do some commercials. When you read through this, I just have to ask, idea. given yeah, given your time, Mr. Ackerman, the life you lived during the Watergate scandal, what do you make of where we are right now? Well, first of all, back in 1973 or four, at the end, when Nixon resigned, I was absolutely convinced this would never happen again in my lifetime. Um, it's happened in my lifetime now between Trump, between George Santos, uh, and everything else that we're seeing in the Republican Party. Um, it's it's really uh, the same thing, but worse, as, as far as I can tell. Um, you've got it kind of spreading into our entire politics. Uh, you don't have the Republican Party really coming together and trying to cleanse itself of, of this cancer that is on the presidency, to quote um, John Dean from back in the Watergate days. Um, I just think we're in a very bad spot right now where our democracy is at stake. Uh, that uh, people are, are unfortunately relying on a lot of these lies. Uh, the lies that George Santos was telling are not much different uh, than the lies that Donald Trump is on trial right now for in New York yeah. State uh, with respect to his financial statements. So you're looking at a lot of the same behavior um, by these two politicians. Uh, unfortunately, well, that's an I interesting think thing that you point out, though, in that case, is, the, is there going to be a conversation about a double standard in the Republican Party once George Santos goes away? Oh, I think absolutely there is. I mean, you're going to see that George Santos um, is, is 
going to be expelled. Um, and I think the problem <coughs> here is that Republicans are looking at this trial date in the Eastern District, which is scheduled for September of this coming year, which is right in the middle of the congressional campaign. Um, now, you've got to ask yourselves, why are the Republicans not as concerned about uh, the trials that are coming up for Donald Trump on March 4th in the District of Columbia, uh, on May 2nd or 3rd in Florida, uh, and then the following cases are going to take place in, uh, the, in Manhattan and then in Georgia. So any of those could blow up. Well, most likely each of them will result in convictions. So you've got to ask yourself, why is the Republican Party not taking the same posture with Donald Trump that I think they're going to wind up taking with George Santos? Right. But one's the former U.S. president and the other one is a brand new congressman from the 3rd District of New York. But you mentioned those uh, slew of cases, the former president and his legal troubles ahead. Which are you most specifically focused on? Well, I think the one to focus on right now is the one in Washington, D.C., uh, the election interference case. I don't think there's any doubt that that is going to move ahead on um, uh, on March uh, 3rd uh, or 4th, whatever it is. And he, the judge has already set down a January date uh, to start the process of selecting a jury in that case. Uh, it's only one defendant. It's not very complicated in terms of motions. Uh, so I think that one, uh, if you read through that indictment, the evidence here is going to be overwhelming. You've got the former vice president, Mike Pence, testifying against him as a star witness. You've got his own lawyers who are White House counsel that will be testifying against him. You've got other people uh, like uh, Kenneth Chesbrough, who's come out in Georgia now, is cooperating, that's met with Donald Trump and is likely to testify in this case. Uh, there's a whole slew of witnesses that are going to be testifying, not to mention the fact um, that Donald Trump is on tape in Georgia, which they'll also use in that case. So mm -hmm. I think that's going to be uh, kind of the first case where you're going to see Donald Trump uh, convicted and, and basically sent to prison. Well, we saw the Speaker of the House uh, today unleash all of the January 6th security tape footage. I don't have much time, uh, Mr. Ackerman, but I wonder your thoughts on any impact that might have on these cases. Well, I don't think it's going to have an impact on these cases, but I think it was a sop thrown um, to kind of the, the, that eight-member caucus in, in the House, the far right-wing uh, gets group, um, to help the what they think will help uh, the people who have been charged with crimes for January yeah. 6th, because they normally couldn't get this from the government, the executive branch under Brady, which requires them to give uh, uh, information out that's exculpatory, uh, but this permits them to get this stuff uh, off of the website of the Congress of the U.S. House. So I don't think that's going to go anywhere, but I'm sure that's the motive behind this. Interesting. Former Assistant U.S. Attorney, thank you so much for joining us. That's Nick Ackerman there, of course. We really appreciate your insights. Coming up, our closers are here to wrap up the week with a new poll showing President Biden behind nationally to more than one Republican candidate. That's next on Balance of Power. I want to talk about Governor Newsom. Thank him. He's been one hell of a governor, man. Matter of fact, he could do anything you want. He could have the job I'm looking for. That was President Biden speaking at the APAC conference on Wednesday night, teasing about Governor Gavin Newsom. For more, let's bring in our political panel, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. Thank you both. Our closers, Jeannie, let's start with you. This governor, California Governor Gavin Newsom, gave Xi Jinping a Golden State Warriors jersey. I'm looking at the photo now. I believe we have some video of it. And Xi Jinping is absolutely grinning. He is smiling ear to ear. But if you're a governor that wants to potentially run for president, as the President Biden was joking there, is this the right message you send to the American people? 
<laughs> it does seem a bit tone deaf if he intends to run. I think he's hoping that the American public forgets this when he decides to run in four years. But the reality is, you know, this happened. We also saw the standing ovation with the CEOs when Xi Jinping just walked in. And this has really led many people to scratch their head and ask exactly what you asked, Anne Marie, is do these people not realize the view of the American public and of many of the people investing in their companies and potentially voting for Gavin? Newsom as it portends to China. So I do think it was a bit of a tone deaf thing, but this is how Gavin Newsom, I think he feels like he's got more time before he decides to make an entry into the race, despite what Joe Biden said. Well, I don't know, Rick, maybe he's taking a page out of the Donald Trump book. I thought the whole point was they respect me. I'm friends with them. They love me. We have love letters. Uh, leaders of countries get along here. What's wrong with that? Putin, uh, Kim Jong-un, why not President Xi? Yeah, I've, I had a little whiplash from San Francisco this week. I don't know uh, how you're doing, Anne-Marie, but, like, we went from calling the guy a dictator to saying he's a partner and a friend, um, you know, uh, standing ovations from CEOs. Uh, I, I got to tell you, we're on the verge of uh, an altercation of epic proportion with China, and we act as if they are saving our economy when he was here specifically to have his economy saved by us. and. Huh. So I, I really think that uh, there's going to be some fallout to this visit. Uh, it didn't accomplish much. Uh, the, the few agreements we had were, were uh, important, but not, you know, sort of scale. It's not going to make a change in the trade relation and the security relationship, things like that, that are really uh, much more important. A climate, nothing. Right. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I've got, I think this administration goes back and they, they recalibrate in the sense that, no, we actually are in a competition with China. They are adversaries to us. They aren't our friend and our partner. And, uh, and I can imagine you're going to see more uh, efforts to try and constrain the uh, technological development of the People's Liberation Army. And, and you know, that's what this administration has been saying it's going to do, and that's what it's been doing. And I don't know, maybe they got off message. <laughs> But that's certainly not how they've acted in San Francisco. Well, not everyone, though, Rick. I mean, we did have that comment from President Biden. He once again said that Xi Jinping is a dictator, even though it did look like it made Secretary of State Antony Blinken very uncomfortable. But I sat down with Rahm Emanuel, the U.S. ambassador to Japan, who said that China and he has been quite critical. And he said he's not toning down his tweets about his criticism of China, by the way. But he said that she is desperate for the capital inflow. And that split screen was she begging for U.S. capital and Biden actually getting something out of it when it comes to military to military communication. I mean, at the end of the day, is it a good thing that military to military communication has been restored? Yeah, but that's like saying it's a it's a good thing to have something very small happen. I mean, the idea that they wouldn't return our phone calls during important conflicts, you know, in their region, that they are harassing our military in the South China Sea, they're blocking sea lanes. I mean, like, let's not forget what's going on here, right? I mean, that's a minimum basic requirement. I mean, she had to agree to something, and he agreed to being able to talk on the telephone. I'm sorry, but that's not very compelling to me when we have rooms full of trillions of dollars of investment sitting there, you know, applauding Xi at a time when he's desperate for our economic support. Uh, we should have gotten more for this visit. And, and so, like, here we are again, propping up a Chinese dictator, as, 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 as Joe Biden would say, and, and in a process of saying two different things. One, like what you said, the ambassador to Japan saying, hey, watch out, these guys are not our friends. I mean, Joe Biden's the one who told a group of, uh, of investors they're our friends, but at the same time, his National Security Council is telling Wall Street, watch out about what you're investing in in China. Well, Jeannie, we're talking about how this plays nationally, and by that, of course, we usually mean the campaign trail. And when you look at what's happening in the Republican contest for president here, we're watching the, the one person on the stage, the one candidate with actual foreign policy experience, Enjoy a bit of a surge, certainly in New Hampshire, and that would be Nikki Haley, of course, our former ambassador to the U.N. How does that compare to the image that Joe Biden is casting on China? And what opportunity do, do we have here for Nikki Haley in this conversation? You know, she is moving up. She's moving in the right direction. We've seen the latest polls, the New Hampshire one for CNN. Um, we've seen the Marist. Mm -hmm. But the reality is she remains far and below Donald Trump. And unless there's going to be consolidation and people decide to get out, namely those other gentlemen on the stage, and we see no, no sign of that, 
then she probably doesn't have the ability to move up. I mean, you look at that New Hampshire poll and you've got almost six or seven out of 10 people supporting Donald Trump saying that they will stick with him. And actually his electability numbers are rising there, not falling. And that's why we've seen the Biden team in just the last 48 hours say they're going to go tougher on Trump because this looks like it's going to be a rematch. So yes, Haley's moving in the right direction, but no, it's not not something that I think we can count on unless we see a consolidation and we don't see anything about that. And that's really what has got to be alarming for anybody who's a never Trumper on the Republican side. And to your point, Joe, she is one of the only people in the field accepting Donald Trump with foreign policy experience on the Republican right. side. That's Ginny Shanzano along with Rick Davis. Our panel will stay with us coming up. Elon Musk in the hot seat over unchecked anti-Semitic content and commentary on his social media platform, causing some major advertisers to flee already. We'll have more on that next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Some big advertisers are pulling ads from X, what most people still call Twitter, following Elon Musk's commenting on an anti-Semitic post on the platform. For more, we bring back our political panel, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, Jeannie Shanzano from New York today, political science professor at Iona University. I'm sure you both have strong feelings about this, Rick. These are big names. We're talking about Apple, IBM. Uh, a couple of others here making a statement, not necessarily ripping up the contract, but pausing their ad spending here, which is a lot of money. What is Elon Musk doing? Yeah, look, I mean, frankly, Elon Musk is doing what he's been doing, right? I mean, he has had a history of anti-Semitic posts uh, giving uh, space to uh, white nationalists and, and others who have espoused hate. And, and, and he's done it in sort of this uh, capacity to be able to sort of live to fight another day. Mm -hmm. I, I think the jig is up now. I mean, he's done this now in an incredibly hot environment uh, around yeah. uh, anti-Semitism. The entire world is paying attention to this. Yeah. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see many foreign countries, uh, companies, uh, also pull in their advertising. I mean, this is not just a U.S. corporate relationship. He, he relies on the global community for financial support. And and it comes at a time where every in, you know, indication I've read is that uh, they're under a lot of stress financially. And so how this is going to help uh, X uh, is baffling to me. And yet he, he, doesn't seem to, he doesn't seem to care. Jeannie, the White House, uh, Andrew Bates, has come out with a statement. And the White House is taking a tough line with Elon Musk. And they're calling the reply an, quote, unacceptable act that endangers Jewish communities. Do you foresee... The White House taking on Elon Musk, even though the campaign certainly needs a social media platform like X, and you see the administration use it on the daily. Yeah, they should take him on. Everybody should take him on. This is the richest man in the world with one of the most powerful platforms who is supporting white replacement theory, Tree of Life, Charlottesville. This theory has gotten people killed. It is a terrible moment. Three weeks after he meets with Benjamin Netanyahu, there is no excuse whatsoever. And the White House and everybody else, including on the Republican side, I'm happy they are taking him on as they write should he tried to walk this back not nearly enough leadership matters whether it's of a country or a company you do not support this kind of hate rhetoric it's damaging and shameful on his part and he needs to do better and he needs to be called out on this and i'm very glad advertisers and the white house and other leaders of our country yeah. are doing just that I don't want to put you on the spot with a minute left here, Rick, but I will. What does the board do? You know about crisis management. What does the board and the, the rest of the leadership put Elon Musk aside? This is There's a company at stake here. What should be the crisis management? Yeah, look, I mean, there have already been calls for him to resign his p position on the board, distance himself from the platform. Uh, I don't see that as happening. I mean, he sees all these entities that he owns as his own babies, sure right? And like that, it. you know, they really are just an extension of his political views and his cultural views. I mean, for a guy who has campaigned so hard against woke, he's the most woke person I've seen in a long time because all he does is get involved in these cultural issues. Amazing. 
quote, most work, woke person, according to Rick Davis, when he's talking about Elon Musk. All right, Rick Davis, Jeannie Shanzano, thank you both so much for joining us. A trifecta of cities this evening, Joe, between San Francisco, yeah, this is pretty Washington, cool. Washington, I'm glad we put it New together. York. We miss you back here. Are you, are you back next week or what? But I'm going to be in New York, but back on the East Coast on Monday, ahead of Thanksgiving. Good. All these stories and more over the weekend on the Washington Edition newsletter on the Terminal Line from San Francisco and Washington. Thanks for joining Joe and I. This is Bloomberg.